Routing between LAN subnets is a huge topic and it can be rather complex. In this video, I'll give you the basics of each type that's part of CCNA so you're ready to then dive into the specific topics. So in the CCNA Cert Guide 2 Volume Set in Volume 1, Part 5, Chapter 18, that chapter has a lot of content. So I started to create a video about the first major section's content in video form, you know, varying the way I teach something about it to be an alternative source as usual. And I came up with an introductory section that blew up into an entirely separate video, and this is that video. So this video outline is basically introducing each of these four sections in the chapter to give you some bigger context. There's just a lot to learn here in that chapter. Slow down, settle in, read a section, practice in lab, practice with packet tracer, that kind of thing. So take your time with this chapter. Now, what chapter is it? Well, if you've got the more recent books as of 2024, when I recorded this video, it's the one with the green swoosh that says second edition. Then we're talking about chapter 18. If you have the earlier ones that are first edition that don't have the green swoosh, is chapter 17. Now this video is a little different. Usually I have some promises I make to you if you hang around to the end of the video. Well, guess what? I'm not really making you any promises because this video doesn't really match a section of the book. So yeah, there's not going to be any review activity or extra. And honestly, there's nothing to match to give you advice of what to skip in the book because there's no matching section. So let's look back in time back before Cisco had made any features specific for routing packets over subnets that exist in VLANs. Back then there were layer two switches, which you've learned a lot about for CCNA. And you've got trunks between those switches and you've got access ports with devices assigned to VLANs. Devices in VLAN one are in one subnet, devices in VLAN two are in a second subnet. And in order to send data between devices in two different subnets, we need something that does routing. So you could have bought a router back in those days and connected it up to the network, but you would have needed, get this, separate physical interfaces for every subnet, for every VLAN. Why is that? Well, the router operates on this idea of an interface connected into each subnet, and that was all it did inherently. So Cisco said, well, of course, we can do better than that, right? Uh, do we know any technologies that would let us use one physical link to support multiple VLANs? Well, sure, VLAN trunking, right? So the first thing off the bat was to say, hey, let's add some code into the router operating system to say, let's use one physical link. We'll enable trunking on both ends of the link. So now we can send frames that are part of VLAN 1 and VLAN 2 and VLAN 3 and so on, and then create a way for the router to have some kind of an interface that can give it an IP address in each subnet that resides on each VLAN. And because now we've got a router with one physical link connected to the LAN, it's just a router like on the end of a stick. <laughs> you guessed it, router on a stick. Now that was really the first feature that Cisco added that focused on routing between these LAN-based subnets, and they've made others over the years. Today, you wouldn't really use router on a stick with a big campus with this distribution and access layer over here, but you might still see it, say, in a branch office, where it's just big enough to where you might want a separate router and switch. Your switch might have enough ports to connect all these PCs, maybe some phones with a PC on the other end, support several VLANs, hook up one cable between the router and the switch, and use router on a stick configuration to route into those subnets and then out to the WAN, maybe on the left-hand side of that figure. So the next thing Cisco really did was they said, hey, let's, let's not do that with a separate router. Let's add some code and some maybe some hardware even into some switches to make them capable of also routing. And the icon set got expanded to include this icon that means here's a layer two switch that can also do layer three routing. So the industry started calling that layer three switching or multi-layer switching, both terms, and that's what the icon represents. Now behind the scenes, if you think of these devices as being layer three switches or multi-layer switches, and you think of them as being represented by the gray rectangles, there's a layer two switching function that's configured just like before. Like all this trunking is configured just like before. VLAN's configured just like before. And then all the IP addressing and routing is configured 
much like before, but it's subtly different using some interface types called switched virtual interfaces or SVIs as configured with the interface VLAN command. All right, that topic happens to be the second major section in that chapter. Next up, let's focus on the layer two switching part of a design for just a moment. So we've got these layer two only switches and these multi-layer switches, and let's focus on the ports where we're used to seeing layer two switching happen. So what do I mean by that? We've got these ports that behave just like they would on a normal layer two switch. That is, they act like switch ports. They learn MAC addresses based on incoming frames. They forward incoming frames based on the destination MAC, based on the MAC table. They receive a whole frame. They forward the same frame. Switching logic, right? So there's this idea that Cisco added over time was to say, hey, there are times when maybe we don't want that logic. So the little S's in the diagram are representing the ports where, hey, the switches are using that same old switch port logic. But what about these links connected from a multi-layer switch up to a router? The router port doesn't act like that, right? right? A, a router port acts like we see over on the right. Router ports, they have IP addresses and they have connected subnets. And when they receive an Ethernet frame, they de-encapsulate the IP packet and they forward based on the IP routing table and they re-encapsulate the packet, right? Router logic. So it turns out there's this idea that Cisco added in there to where we say these ports on the switches where I've put a little R here are quote routed ports. That is, it's a port that the switch will treat like a router would treat its interfaces and it gives you some design advantages, all right? Once you have that down, then we get to yet another deeper complexity. Like I said, there's a lot of concept in this chapter. So now we've got this same design, but instead of one link between each pair of switches, we have two. You could have three, you could have four, you could have up to eight. And we can combine them, and that's what these little ovals represent. And when you combine them like that, you can load balance the traffic over them and expand the capacity in your network and availability. And we call those ether channels. And you'll see that term in the exam topics, ether channel. So multiple parallel links between a pair of devices in a LAN. There's your ether channel concept. Next concept, if the ports are switched ports, it's a layer two ether channel. Remember that idea of routers up there at the top? Well, we can put multiple links up there, combine those into an ether channel. And if we make those ports on the switches be routed ports, it's a layer three concept. We call those layer three ether channels. Both terms are called out in the CCNA exam topics. The final of the four big sections of that chapter focuses on this idea. So you've got a branch office and instead of a separate physical router and switch, you find a model that everything's combined into one device as represented by this rectangle. And that device does routing and it does switching in that there are some switch ports, but the device may tend more toward being a router with some added switch ports in it. And when that's the kind of device you buy there for that branch office, uh, the configuration is subtly different than what you might see on a device that's primarily a switch that's got some routing added to it. So in that last section of chapter 18, uh, the book walks through what those differences are and how to configure a router with its integrated switch ports. As I mentioned in the beginning, this video doesn't really match a section of a chapter. So there's no such uh, section. I do have some videos that do match a few of those sections. So look for those. Read the chapters four sections. There's a lot of content. It's definitely worth slowing down and making sure that you get it right. Thanks for hanging around till the end, everybody. Much appreciated. Give me a like, give me a comment. Let me know what you wanna see more about with this routing between subnets on VLANs. All right, talk to you soon.